I'm Allison Sanger with the Autism Science Foundation, and we're here today at the Yale Child Study Center with Dr. Jamie McParland. Jamie is Assistant Professor and Associate Director of the Developmental Electrophysiology Lab at the Yale Child Study Center. Thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Allison. Thanks for talking with me. Jamie, why don't you start out by telling us what exactly goes on in the Electrophysiology Lab? Sure. Um, so we study, electrophysiology refers to the study of brain activity in terms of the electricity that our neurons produce. So our neurons are all small electrical machines and when we do anything, when we talk, when we breathe, when we think, when we see something happen, they produce a small amount of electricity and then we can record that from the scalp. What's nice about electrophysiology is it's non-invasive, it's easy to tolerate, it's like literally like wearing a wet hat. And so what we do in the electrophysiology lab is try to study the way children on the autism spectrum perceive different kinds of information. And we're very interested specifically in the way they perceive information that's important for, for navigating social interactions. And what have we learned through electrophysiology about the way that children with autism perceive social interactions? It's a good question. So the first thing that we've learned relates to, to, the, to the unique information that we get from electrophysiology. So we, we have a very good sense of when things happen with electrophysiology. Our, our brain does many, many different things in the same part of the brain within short periods of time. And so what this lets us do is parse that into individual events. So when I see a face, first I see just shapes. Then I recognize it as a face. And then I may recognize it as your face. And then I may recognize it as a happy face. So what we find is at the very early stages recognizing a face as a face, people with autism are slower. They don't have, have this, this activity that's face sensitive very early as rapidly. And we're talking very early, in less than two tenths of a second. And so what's interesting to think about, about that is that if we think of this process of going from it's a face to this is an important face or this is a, a, an, an emotionally evocative face, at the very first stage of the game, they're already about 10% behind in terms of the pacing. And so we think that this is a reflection of their developmental experience in part. That they might not be paying, to the right, paying attention to the right kinds of information and so they're not getting faster over time. And so are we looking at phase processing as a, as a biomarker for diagnosis or as an opportunity for intervention? I think both. I think that it's a complex story. For sure, not every person with autism shows this delay. There have been some studies that have found them to be right on pace. And so there's, it's probably like many of the things that we see a, as part of the autism spectrum it doesn't apply to everyone. It applies to some people. We also know that it's not just true of people with autism. So siblings of people on the spectrum have been shown to have differences in latency, young siblings who haven't yet developed autism, and then also actually parents of children on the spectrum show some differences in the latency. So it's not... Um, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence with having autism. So in terms of a biomarker, it would rec represent some kind of risk factor or reflection of a different kind of experience. And then in terms of intervention, yes, it points us in the, the direction that, that gearing attention to the right kinds of things might be able to change the development, which really isn't a revolutionary idea. But we know that, that we're not born with this very, very fast brain activity. It's slower. It's there very, very early in life. By three months, we know that there's this very specific electrophysiological response to faces. But over time, we get faster until we're around 14. It's as fast. And so we, our, our theory is that in that process, people on the spectrum aren't kind of catching up. They're not specialized. And the idea is that then if we can, can get them to pay attention to the right kinds, of information to look at the face, the right parts of the face, that we might be able to see this more normative activity. And then the idea is that that would carry on to more socially, uh, socially critical kinds of cognitive operations. So face processing and eye tracking have been around for a few years now. And I think uh, one thing we hear from parents is really a sense of frustration is how is this moving along and when is it going to start to translate into something that we can use uh, for intervention. So where are we sort of in the continuum of face processing and eye tracking? We have to think of eye tracking and electrophysiology as two distinct things. 
but not for much longer. In fact, now in our labs, we're actually doing both at the same time. And so what we see is really hopeful for the very question you asked about, is that we can then change the kinds of experiments that we do. So when I talk about this fast brain response to faces, I'm talking about showing people very fast flashes of static faces. It's not the way we interact with another person. Faces move. Faces react to the things that we do. And so now what we're doing is developing experiments by combining eye tracking and EEG is looking at how faces respond to, to a person. So for example, I might show a face on screen and it's neutral, but when you look to the face, and only when you look to the eyes versus when you look to the mouth, the face smiles back at you. And so we can look at how people respond in more interactive kinds of settings, which I think is really critical for, for two reasons. One, for, for shaping behavior. Right? If you have a face that can respond, we can change the, we hope, change the way people interact with these, thing, with these representations of people. And two, because I think at, one of the difficulties applying the scientific insights that we've had to people on the spectrum is understanding what's relevant to what person. So I've already said that not every person shows these kinds of differences that we see. And so maybe there are particular groups of people with autism that are going to show particular differences in brain activity and therefore would respond to particular kinds of interventions. So I think that by having these more interactive paradigms will also get more, more scientific power to try to understand meaningful differences towards subtyping people on the spectrum for the purpose of prescribing specific interventions and also predicting how people will respond to interventions. And what do you think is the timeline for us to have access to that information? That's a, uh, that's a really good question. I would, in our lab, we are now piloting the experiments that will, ass that will assess these behaviors and then my colleagues are, are working to develop paradigms that will change them now. So within a few years, and there's lots, of course, is a very, very hot area of research within the broader field, and so outside of the Child Study Center, lots of people are looking at these things as well. Okay, well, maybe we'll end here so you can get back to your lab and get back to work, because we're certainly awaiting all of that information. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Allison. It's a pleasure to have a chance to talk about our work.